Well, good morning, church family. Uh, I'm Parker, the preteen and middle school minister in the church. Welcome to our daily devotional. Uh, I hope that this Easter has been a good time of reflection for you uh, over what Christ has done. Uh, I, this is always my favorite time of the year, not because of the Easter egg hunts or uh, any of the the bunny uh, chocolate bunnies that you get to eat, but it's it's a good time of reflection for me always whenever I get to think about the work, the saving work of Christ, that he has died for our sins and he has risen from the grave. Um, and he is risen. Uh, he is alive now and sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Um, sometimes whenever, I, I, I think whenever we tell the story of Jesus, sometimes we leave that part out. Uh, it's like, well, he raised and uh, now what, you know? But he exists now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And so uh, we can always look to him and see that. But today I want to look a little bit earlier than the, uh, the resurrection account uh, in the book of John. And I want to actually see where Jesus' power over death was most significantly on display before his own resurrection. And I think that is Lazarus. So if you would, please turn with me to John chapter 11, uh, verses 17 through 27. It reads this. Now when the time came, or now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to, to Martha and Mary to console them concerning the brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And so this is a very, very clear de declaration of who Jesus is. Uh, I think it's worth noting that Jesus doesn't just say he will bring the resurrection. He's the one who, that's going to make it happen. But he says something even stronger. He says he is the resurrection and the life. Um, obviously, there's two types of death that it's talking about here in this passage. One's physical and one is spiritual. Uh, we're not getting the passage if we only look at one or the other. Uh, if we look to Ephesians 2, we can see this kind of paralleled uh, with the idea of spiritual death, about how we died in our sins and our transgressions against God. But through Christ's work on the cross, we've been able to come into new life. And this is what Jesus is saying in this passage. He says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Though he may die physically like Lazarus. He will live eternally with Christ. And so we see the gospel is just so prevalent in this passage here. And there's a few application points I think we can take from this. Um, one is that we can live without fear clinging to this truth. Um, and the reason we can live without fear is not because we know God will protect us from any trouble or any evil that comes our way. We live without fear because what is most important in us is eternally secure in Christ. Uh, I think it's a lie that we tell ourselves whenever we say, uh, God will never give you anything you can't handle. Um, I promise you that many times in life, God will give you things you can't handle. And the reason he does that is it's not supposed to be you you're looking for. You're not supposed to be uh, trying to handle all things by yourself. You're supposed to be totally dependent on him. You're supposed to look to him in times of trouble. And even harder is that he has made no promise that he will deliver you from that. 
Um, there's a lot of suffering in this life. Let's not sugarcoat that. But if suffering causes us to lose faith in God, that reveals our wrong belief of God. Let me say that one more time. If suffering causes us to lose faith in God, that reveals our wrong view of God. And so remember Job. Uh, who was Job? It was this, this faithful man uh, to God, and uh, he was tested by God. And when he was tested, he stayed very faithful for a long time. Uh, he had his entire family stripped away from him. His, his whole life went to shambles. Uh, he, he denies his friends who keep telling him he must have done some awful sin uh, in order to get to his current position. He denies them and he remains faithful to God. Um, but by the end, a broken man who really has nothing left he does begin to doubt God. And do you remember what God says? He says, where were you in all of creation when I numbered the stars? If, if, you're, so, uh, if you're so bold, uh, Job, to, to question me, why don't you tell me how many stars there are? Right? Why don't you tell me since you know so much more than me? Uh, the reason why, 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 why God gives Job this response is we are in no position to question God for anything that happens, including our own suffering. Um, the truth is God has a master plan that none of us know for revealing his glory. Um, and suffering, whether we like it or not, is an essential part of that plan. Um, and so I would say do not take pride in your earthly comfort, in the comfort, in the good blessings God has given you in this life. God can take it away just like that, like he did with Job. And it is not a measure of how much God loves you with how much he blesses you. Uh, don't be like Job's friends. If we start thinking that blessings is equivalent to how much God loves you, we're thinking like Job's friends who think that uh, the God will always give blessings to those who he loves and uh, he will always cause immense suffering for those he hates. That's called the retribution principle. It's not a real thing in Scripture. Um, Oftentimes, God might love you immensely and give you the worst suffering. Uh, and God promises suffering. Jesus says, the world will hate you if you follow me. And to follow me, you must take up a cross. You must take up my cross to follow me. Um, whoever will save his life will lose it. But then the good news of this passage is that Whoever will lose his life will save it. Uh, there is life for those who die. And let's not sugarcoat God's promises. It's true. We say it all the time. God has a wonderful plan for your life, um, but it may involve immense suffering. We leave off that part. God had a wonderful plan for Stephen's life, the first martyr who was stoned, uh, for Paul's life, who had years, years in chains for the gospel message, for Polycarp. Uh, this amazing story where he was burned at the stake and the flames would not burn him, so a man stabbed him and he died there. And he had a wonderful plan for Jesus' life when he went to that cross and died an awful, awful death. Um, a lot of times, I've said this before, we think about G being more like Jesus as being uh, a more humble person, a more patient person, a more loving person. Uh, we don't think about it being a person that suffers. Um, being like Jesus means being a sufferer. Being a Christian means being a sufferer. Some, some people, some Christians may suffer more than others. It's a part of God's plan, but mu we must embrace it whenever it happens and not let doubts emerge from the suffering he gives us. Because the truth is this, and I don't want to come here just to beat you down. I want to come to encourage you. God is good. And God doesn't get any less good in the hard times than he is whenever he's prospering you. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And it is true regardless of circumstance. He is unchanging, and he is faithful. Um, what is most important in this life is secured eternally with Christ. Um, and that is our encouragement. Let go of this world and look to what God has done for your eternity and put your faith and hope in that. That's what Jesus died for. 
Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll hope to see you tomorrow at nine.